Um, so thanks very much to all guys for inviting me and um, loving talking to uh, people that have the same obsession as I do. Um, I'm going to talk about um, quantum batteries. So we have an echo. Is there? Seems so. There's a problem. Oh, yeah. So you have to turn off it. Okay. So I'm going to talk about quantum batteries. And my first apology is that I'm not going to be talking about the kinds of batteries that uh, might be useful for uh, helping with climate change or anything like that. Um, and the second uh, apology is that just uh, randomly sort of with quantum in front of me. This. Um, I, this is uh, more of a sermon than a, uh, than presenting recent work. I'm going to talk about these three, uh, but I'll touch on these three um, older works. Um, and it's trying to work with um, some great co-authors, uh, Philip Feist, uh, Colin Maria Scandola, Carlos Raheri, um, uh, Luis Vassanes, Lilia Del Rio, uh, uh, Alvaro Alamba, and Chris Perry. And um, Philip is in the audience and can ask him, uh, can answer any of our questions. So, Good. So, um, what kind of why am I in? What kind of batteries am I interested in? Um, I'm interested in the case where we have multiple resources. So we have um, batteries, uh, several batteries, more than one often, um, because we're interested, uh, or I'm interested in multiple resource theories. Um, and when we add batteries, we'll see that we also need to add a bank in order to get reversibility. Um, I'm also interested in resources which need not commute with each other. Um, that's a bit why we got the word quantum there. Also with um, batteries which store the resource coherently. Um, another good reason to put uh, the word quantum there. And also um, I'm interested in quantifying the fluctuations of the resource which appears in that battery. Um, why? Um, uh, why am I interested in batteries? Well, I'm interested in the interplay of resources, the trade-offs which happen. And we call that like a general, like a second law of quantum resources within. Uh, because it's, it's one has a similar thing in the relevance. Um, I'm also interested in, for example, understanding the fluctuations in these batteries, um, because I'm interested in making um, contact with, for example, um, in uh, I'm interested in uh, different communities talking to each other. So, uh, you know, a lot of people here, we're doing thermal operations and the resource theory of thermodynamics, um, but there's all these other communities, for example, the sarcastic thermodynamics people, and they actually do the same thing we do, but they have different language. And so part of the motivation for this is to try and speak the same language um, and be able to make contact with people doing stochastic thermodynamics, for example, um, and doing that by maybe like uh, thinking about thermal operations in a slightly different way. Um, and then I'm just doing the word reversibility because it's an obsession here as well. So uh, I'll we'll talk about that. Good. So there's a few take-home messages, um, and one of them is that whenever we see like a nice majorization relation or a generalization of majorization, then we should look for fluctuation relations, and we should look for these uh, what I you know what is often called second law equalities, right? Which is a, a kind of a nicer way of talking about the second law. Um, and the other little take-home message is because there's been a lot of embezzlement going on. Um, in this workshop, um, I wanted to um, maybe um, offer that maybe we should think of embezzlement in terms of um, not just in the sense that these, an embezzling state doesn't change very much, but that actually the resource in that embezzling state changes quite a bit. Um, and so to think of embezzling states in relation to what I we sometimes call entanglement batteries. Mm -hmm. Good. So um, let me just. Quickly, I know this is not, uh, not the audience for it, but just the, this kind of this original standard paradigm um, is that we have a, um, a class of operations, and then we have what uh, back in the day was sometimes called free states. And for my part in that, I apologize. You'll see why that is maybe not the best terminology. We should stop calling them free states. Um, and then um, you can show that for any resource theory, um, which is convex, um, and the, the unique asymptotic measure is the relative entry distance. 
Um, and the reason that the term free states maybe is a little bit dangerous is because as soon as you have more than one resource, you see that the states that were free in a particular resource theory should no longer be free um, in, uh, if we have multiple resources. So a multiple resource theory is that I have a class of operations, C1, and a class of operations, C2, for a different resource theory. And the combined resource theory is I think the intersection of those two class of operations. So for example, our favorite one is thermodynamics. Um, I'm using our collective way. Um, it's thermodynamics. Um, um, so for example, uh, thermodynamics is the uh, combination of the resource theory of um, noisy operations, where the maximally mixed state is not the free state, but the invariant state. Um, and then it's the resource theory of energy not increasing operations for which the ground state is the kept state. Okay. And the reason we shouldn't consider them free is that when you combine these resource theories, if you are allowed any of them as a free state, then the resource theory trivializes. So here, for example, um, you have these two different sets of invariant states. And if you're because the uh, resource theory is convex, if you allow uh, any one of them for free, then you can mix them. If you allow them for free, you can mix them, then you can get out of the set of um, in varying states, and then you can do everything. So the resource theory would trivialize if you allow them as free states, any of those free states. Okay. Feel free to ask, ask questions in the middle of this. You can just yell a question in your head, at least clarify questions. We can get to like uh, antagonistic questions at the end. <laughs> um, you can, uh, it, there's, uh, you know, you can also imagine multiple resource theories where the resources uh, have like a little Venn diagram with an intersection, or at least the invariant uh, set. So, for example, in tripartite local operations in classical communication, you have the states which are separable along the Alice Bob versus Charlie cut, and also central versus the Alice versus Bob Charlie cut. Et cetera, et cetera. So, you can have uh, these kinds of uh, multiple resource theories, and then you have um, the ones where the two sets sit inside each other, for example. The combined resource theory of coherence and purity, well, the maximally mixed state is an incoherent state, um, so it sits inside the set of all incoherence. Okay, so those are the three kind of, I think, major classes of multiple resource theories. Um, and immediately, if you consider multiple resource theories, you see that you encounter a problem with reversibility. Imagine you have two resource theories which individually are reversible and which have a unique a monotone of, say, the relative entropy distance, then when you combine them, you lose reversibility right away. So that happens in thermodynamics, um, which is a combined resource theory. Um, and the reason you can see kind of easily why it becomes irreversible, and that's because we have two monotones now, and the chances that they're identical for uh, a state transformation, so imagine I'm trying to go from rho, n copies of rho into k copies of rho prime, well, the monotone one, it might be constant for that transformation, but it's very unlikely that it's constant in terms of the other monotone. And chances are it'll be, you know, tend off the other monotone, the rate will be given by a different value of k prime. And so you can only really do state transformations if these two monotones just happen to be equal for the same value of k, right? I'm going from n copies of rows to k copies of rho prime. So what you end up with is these islands of reversibility, where if they happen to have the same value of the monotone, then they're irreversible. There's irreversible transformations you can do in that little island, but you can't move between the islands because uh, usually these monotones are not equal to the same value. Any questions? It's okay to ask. <laughs> Okay, so we can get around that problem of irreversibility um, uh, by um, introducing a bank. And I apologize, there's another apology. I apologize for the bank. My student was a capitalist. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, what a bank does is it converts one kind of a, a resource into another kind of a resource. Um, and that sounds maybe exotic at a, at a particular exchange rate. So we exchange one resource for another at a particular exchange rate. And um, my favorite bank is the thermal state. Um, and the thermal state is a bank 
which converts purity into energy and vice versa. And the exchange rate that this band offers is given by KT times the temperature. That's the exchange rate of the thermal state bank. Um, so for example, I could store purity in a, in a purity uh, battery. And in general, the amount of purity is given by log D minus the entropy. Um, and then I have an energy battery and that's, you know, stores energy. And we have these two invariant states, the ground state and the maximally mixed state for this resource theory. And now I need to be able to move between, I need to be able to exchange purity. If I've got a, a, a purity battery and an energy battery, I want to be able to exchange one for the other. Um, and I do that with two processes we know and love. They're my favorite two processes. One is a Maxwell demon. The Maxwell demon is a demon who takes purity and converts it into work. And the exchange rate is KT, because if I have one bit of purity, I stick it in a thermal bath, it will be KT bits of work. And the Landauer erasure is someone who takes uh, work, acts it on the Zillard box here, and with, uh, with some exchange rate beta, gets a pure state, okay, out of a mixed state. So that's the, uh, the thermal state is the bank, and you put your system in contact with the bank, it's the thermal state, and that allows us to um, do this conversion between these two different resources. How's the volume? Am I talking too loud? Joe? So, uh, Good. Okay. Questions about banks and thermal states? Yes. So, can you give an example of how, like, you turn a pure state into work? A pure state into work? Like yeah, so here I have a Zillard box, and the, the, it, it, it can be even like a bit, and the pure state means that we know which side the um, of the Zillard box this atom is. So you can like a parent state. So is that so that has equal purity to the thermal state? Yeah, but I can isothermally, you know, just kind of increase its entropy in such a way that I'll be able to extract it. So this is the T yes in the if I increase some entropy and fixed temperature, I can gain, gain energy, convert to energy. But if I put it in contact with the bath, so that's it. Yeah. So this is in principle reversible in this scenario. Um, can I simply think about it as a single resource? Because in this case, the conversion is in principle the same. So you can kind of think of the equivalence between purity. Exactly. Exactly. So what the bank allows you to do, what the thermal state that you do, is it that because it allows you to convert one resource into another, it effectively collapses all your possible resources into one resource. Everything is convertible. You could convert everything into dollars or euros. You probably wouldn't convert anything to British pound anymore, but <laughs> that's also possible. Um, the other um, thing that's important about these batteries is that they should only be a battery for one thing. So a purity battery, which is like a Zillard box, it should have, for example, uh, a, a trivial Hamiltonian, and then we know that we cannot put any energy into our purity battery, right? We know it only stores purity. Likewise, our energy battery, we don't want to dump entropy into our energy battery because then that will allow us to get, we'll get very confused as to whether the energy battery is storing energy or if it's actually storing something else, like the dumping entropy. Yeah. Is should here, should for calculational purposes, or a normative statement that a mixed battery is actually actively unhelpful? <laughs> um, I, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think both, because a, uh, like, if I, if I take an energy battery and I'm allowed to dump entropy into it, I could just thermalize it. And the thermal state of my battery is not a very good battery. Uh, and for computational purposes, we'll see that we really want to keep track of what resource is in what battery and how to formulate a general uh, first law for resource theories. It's very convenient to know that this kind of resource is being stored in this battery and not somewhere, somewhere else. Okay, so in general, we will have a bunch of resources. I'm just picking two because that's the next easiest thing. And so we have battery two, which stores resource two. And it's important that I have my monotone F1, and that's constant in all the class of operations. So the, the, I have a class of operations that operations can act on the battery as well. Um, the, the, the class of operations will be the intersection of the two 
um, resource theories, and I just want to make sure that the battery, the resource in battery two, uh, sorry, for resource two, that the monotone F1 for resource one is constant and vice versa. So that helps me ensure that um, I don't cross pollinate that. And for thermodynamics, if we do that, we get the um, first law. And I'm actually not 100% positive that this is the correct formulation of the first law, um, but uh, it's the best we could come up with, which is that um, we have two kinds of um, resources, so energy and purity. We have the exchange rate, T, which the bank will give us. And these two things are equal to the change in free energy of our state. Okay, so that's how I'm formulating, uh, in the reversible case, this um, first law. Right. And that's certainly true if you look at a battery, like, a, sorry, if you look at the thermal state, the free energy of the thermal state doesn't change at all, but you can convert one um, resource to another using the thermal state and you don't really change its free energy. Whereas if you have some other state, uh, which is not thermal, then you know, you'll change its free energy and then you can actually get one of those resources. Uh, so you can kind of gain actually rather than just convert. And so the generalization is that we have all these other um, resources for one, for two, or three, et cetera. And uh, we have this, what we call the bank monotone um, my student named it, and I'm sorry. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's roughly going to be in, in, in the cases we've looked at, it's the relative entry distance to the bank state. So to the generalized Gibbs state or the generalized thermal state or whatever you want. Um, and if we do that, then what we find is that magically, we, well, not magically, we now have reversibility. So we can go from row to row five, the batteries will change um, and we can go back and forth. And so we had these islands in this resource theory where we had reversibility by coincidence because the two monotones just happened to be equal. And so we could go from, uh, you know, we could have reversibility in this island and reversibility in this island. And now that we have the bank state, we can now go between the islands and get full reversibility. Okay, so that's the idea. Um, and uh, we only came up with uh, uh, one and a half examples. Um, so one example is just uh, the generalized Gibbs state where you have a bunch of other charges like um, chemical potentials and energies, etc. cetera. Um, and they may be non-commuting. So for example, um, we, uh, this was something also studied by the Bristol group and by the UCL group. Um, and um, so for that, you have a generalized first law, which was already known. Um, and then our other example was local operations and energy preservation, uh, which is interesting, I think, in, in terms of understanding like local thermodynamics. So you have entanglement as your resource and you have energy as your resource and we have a trade-off that looks very much like that. Um, uh, first law, but uh, the, the, if you read the paper, it's a bit of a mess um, in terms of we have many different assumptions we need to satisfy in order to get a first law. Um, I don't think we did it. I, I suspect that it could be greatly simplified. So that's partly why I'm interested in the sentence, because I think one could have a much simpler set of assumptions that you could have in order to get a second law. And maybe it would be interesting to also come up with some more interesting examples. Good, any questions about uh, multiple resource theories? Yeah. Uh, what about two banks operating at different temperatures? So it seems by going to one bank for one exchange and to the other bank for the reverse exchange, you could gain, which somehow seems Inconsistent or something, right? So why not? Why why are two banks excluded? That well, operated good. Market? So that's why someone's called like the zeroth law of of resource theories, which is that you need to pick your um, invariant set or the free state in this case. Well, I'm using the word free state, so maybe it's appropriate in this case. The bank state. Um, you you don't want your resource theories to trivialize. So if you allow a give state, you have a thermal state with two different temperatures, mm -hmm. then your resource theory trivializes. But if you say we allow all states for which our resource theory doesn't trivialize, then you will have the equivalence class of all possible states which have the same temperature. 
Good, thank you. So that's like a zero law of resource. Good, so now I'm gonna talk about another irreversible resource theory that we're gonna make reversible because I know you love making irreversible resource theories reversible. <laughs> and it's pure state entanglement. And we want to go from some uh, psi AB to psi AB prime. And Michael Nielsen told us that the way we do that is through majorization. So we need one of those states to majorize the other. I always get, I always know that the opposite of thermodynamics. Um, and um, we want to go from one state to the other. We can do it if they majorize, but that's a very irreversible process, right? Um, and so we can hardly ever do it. Um, also, asymptotically, I claim, and maybe other people have claimed, I think other people have as well, uh, that um, pure state entanglement theory is also irreversible, contrary to what you've been told. Um, and that's because if I, if I do entanglement distillation, um, versus entanglement uh, formation or creation um, or dilution, as they call it, um, there's a square root of n factor, which is different. So I, for the forming state, you have an extra square root of n. And if you go to the bank that my student runs um, and say, oh, can I borrow root n as n goes to infinity um, extra EBIT, they will laugh you out of the bank. Um, because that's actually, you know, it's quite a costly thing. So the, the square root of n does matter. Um, so these two resource theories are irreversible, um, but we can make them reversible. And the way we make them reversible is we do what we do in resource theories. We uh, go from, we look at another resource theory and we look at, find the answer in the other resource theory and see if it applies to the one that we're confused about. And in this case, we go to thermodynamics and um, thermodynamics with a fluctuating work. Um, and so that's another apology that I think we were kind of obsessed with deterministic work, and that was maybe in hindsight, we should have been a bit more open to these fluctuating works. And so um, a very famous relation, how many people have seen the Jarzinski equation? Yeah, it's, a, it's the most beautiful equation. Um, so it's that the expectation value to we allow, we do a, a thermal process, we uh, consider how much work we get in our work battery, and then um, we average that e to the beta w, and we get that on expectation is equal to a particular value. So that's an equality that's remarkable. And the second law, the old time version of the second law, is just the first moment of that. It's just that the average work is less than delta f. So you can expand this out and see that. Um, so it's just an approximation. The second law is just an approximation to this much better second law, which is an equality, the second law equality. And so if we allow for fluctuating work, we get a beautiful second law equality, and that's really how you get reverse it. Right. So what we want to do is we want to do thermal operations, but we want to have a battery, and we want that work battery, we want to allow it to fluctuate. So we take our old school thermal operations, and we add in a little thing that I think it was known in many places, but I stole it from um, the Bristol group. And um, so we have uh, unitary operations on system bath and weight, energy conservation, which you're allowed to change Hamiltonians in energy conservation, you just have a switch. Um, and then we make a translation invariant on the weight. So we allow it to do a unitary, which is translation X, which doesn't know what value uh, of the weight that is. And that has, uh, the consequence of that is that we don't smuggle you don't smuggle entropy into the battery. So this is this notion that a battery should only contain, this, this battery should only be an energy battery. You don't want to dump entropy into it, that would be bad. So that's that old thing of want to make sure that this battery can dump it. I don't know if there's a better way of describing these thermal operations with a battery. Um, like this does the trick, this makes sure we don't smuggle entropy into the battery. Maybe there's a better way of doing it, I don't know. Um, but here's a battery. It's a, it's quantum, it's got a superposition over all work system, and we want it to do that because if we want to say, do like putting coherence and stuff, we can do that. So there's our battery. It's a sum over all possible energies, a battery state. And if we have this battery, and I'm just gonna give you the classical thing because it's maybe more familiar, then what we get is we get a generalization of majorization. Um, and we even get a generalization of thermal measure. So here is, that, so um, this is the probability of going from some, some 
Okay, so so doubly stochastic maps. We imagine that this probably these probabilities are all homologized. So um, this is if, if we sum over this is a doubly stochastic maps, meaning that we map the maximum mid states, the maximum mid states are kind of noisy operations. Then there's Gibbs preserving maps. These preserve the Gibbs states, so like thermal operations. So they have this criteria that if you sum over all S states S, you get back another Gibbs factor. So this is a Gibbs preserving operation, and this gives you thermal majorization or demajorization. And then if you add a fluctuating work system, do people see at the bottom there? If you add a fluctuating work system, then you have another random variable you, you sum over, and it has to satisfy this relation. And this is like a generalization of thermal majorization, where you have fluctuating work, and you can do more things. Right? But you can still count the cost of what you're doing because it's still costing you some amount of work, and that work is counted as it is a distribution of work now. Okay, so we might care about the average of that distribution or whatever. Good. And from this, you can get like a um, we were very excited. We got a, a kind of a fine grained version of the Jarzinski equation, and then people told us that this was already well known. Um, <laughs> And I'd like to remind that this gives us a, uh, the first moment gives us the old tiny second law, and but you also get all these higher order directions. Um, but what's nice is, and I'm not gonna write it down here because I also wasn't very happy with it, but there's all these quantum fluctuation relations you can also get, and the Crookes relations, and et cetera, et cetera. So you can, from these thermal operations with fluctuating work, you can get also these quantum fluctuation relations. Um, and again, it's like a bit of an open problem because I think I'm not particularly thrilled with what we have here. Um, good. What are they good for? So one of the things they're good for is to prove a third law. Um, so, um, for example, what kind of third law? Um, Landauer erasure. We all know Landauer erasure. I think uh, where you uh, we came across earlier in this talk, where you use KT log two bits of work to erase a bit which is in an unknown state. So either on the left or right, probably a half. And we always hear that it costs um, KT log two to do that. But um, do we mean on average KT log two, or do we mean that it's always KT log two? Well, it, it turns out that if you want perfect erasure, there will always be fluctuations, and these fluctuations will be um, exceptionally large. And these relations are written here, they're actually this generalization of majorization that I mentioned. So what it turns out is you get a generalization of majorization which is more powerful than the fluctuation relation and tells you that if you want to do perfect ratio, the fluctuations go to infinity, which is a bit like a third law because your resources in some sense have to be infinite, even though it's very rare. Similar to the infinite. Good. So now we're gonna steal from the thermodynamics people. Don't tell them, but we take their energy battery, which is a state W, their battery is a superposition over all uh, energies. Uh, so we convert the energy to a, some number of EBITs. So this is, instead of this or W now, is a number of EBITs. And we have W EBITs. And now we take a superposition over all different numbers of EBITs. And we were, we were discussing the other day whether this is like a, a, how close it is to embezzlement. I'm not entirely sure anymore. I thought it was like investment. A bit like investment. But maybe it's not exactly investment. Good. And so you use this entanglement battery, you use this entanglement battery, and when you use this entanglement battery, what you do is you find that you can go from side to side prime, and you can do it reversibly. And if you quantify the fluctuations of EBITs in your entanglement battery, you find that they obey something exactly like, that looks exactly like the Jarzinski equality. And if you expand it out of first order, you get like the second law of entanglement, which is that the amount, the average amount of entanglement in your entanglement battery um, you know, is, is bounded by the change in entropy of Alice in this pure state entanglement. So you do reversibly, you can go from back and forth between these two states, and the cost of the gain will be given by, on average, the difference in entropy, but you can actually quantify the fluctuations of that. And so that's a bit of my push to like count the amount of EBITs in your 
um, embedding state or you're in, in your entanglement battery because that is telling you um, that it's quantifying for you the amount of work or entanglement in the states. Questions? Yes. So the this idea of the fluctuation relation in thermal, it, it's well motivated by the idea that you have a non-equilibrium system, right? So work fluctuates for this reason. Your energy can fluctuate if you're in a non-equilibrium state. Yeah. Am I supposed to think about this in the same way that there is some sort of non-equilibrium state of an equilibrium that can be fluctuating? How does that yeah, I, good question. And um in some sense it's I, I it's really interesting because the only difference between the kind of thermodynamics and entanglement in the sense is that the major radiation relation goes the opposite opposite way. And it turns out that the proof techniques were quite different. So I don't I feel like the, the reason for this entanglement fluctuation relation is, is literally I mean it's the same in that it comes from majorization. It's because you have majorization that you see that you will get a fluctuation relation. But um, you have to do quite a bit of work to see that you get it, and it's not just from, you know, wasn't obvious. But in some sense, um, you know, the, 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 it's the opposite, right? The maximally mixed state is not the is is not the uh, equilibrium state. It's the target state in this case. It's the maximally it's the maximally entangled state, which has the maximally mixed um, um, uh, state for Bob or Alex. Um, I, I didn't write here, but I also want to say that if you now do entanglement distillation and purification, you can do it now on a single copy level. You don't need to have a large number end of, um, of initial states in order to do distillation. You can do it on a single copy level, just keep running it on a single copy level over and over, and it's completely reversible. So no square root of n uh, nonsense. I'm going to end, I know there's two questions, I'm going to end with my last slide, and if, um, if that's okay. Or I can take question. Oh, let me end. Uh, Boxana Finale is the the four, the four laws of resource theories. I apologize that they're um I didn't no, I'm not gonna apologize because I didn't invent this way of putting four laws and starting with a zero point. Um so the oh wait, we're not there. Huh? Sorry. Exit full screen. Exit full screen. <laughs> uh, maybe you should take these questions while I'm keying up the. I'm going to ask you a question while I key up the. Uh, uh, some form of uh, a quantum fluctuation theorem. Uh, <laughs> the second order expansion leads to the fluctuation dissipation relation close to equilibrium. So, in your entanglement fluctuation theorem, is there any corresponding or similar relation to the case? Um, that's a good question, and I don't know the answer to it. Yeah, it's a good question, though. Maybe we, we can set up the open problems. Thanks. So, uh, how do these entanglement fluctuations manifest? Are they like different outcomes of a probabilistic protocol or something? Yeah, well, it's you know, you do a state transformation. And your battery will have some red. Yeah, it, it, it will. Like it's it's very strange because for two reasons. One is your battery has to be um, in order to keep doing this. You want your bar batteries to maintain purity because you're going to from a pure state to another pure state, and so you have to be completely decoupled from it. And that can only happen in the limit that the battery is infinite. And the limit that the battery is infinite, you can't really count the amount of entanglement that's in it. So you know you can see this as. If you do this many times, then you'll be able to gather the statistics and perform a measurement in order to know exactly what was happening. But for a single state transformation, it's like an embezzling state. Measuring it doesn't tell you anything. But that's the same like with work. Um, in work, um, you know, uh, if I have a coherent superposition over energies, then if I if I use that battery to to do a task with the work. Okay, I've used work, and that's definitely changing the average amount of energy in my battery. But I, the state itself is very close to its original state because it was a superposition over all possible energy. Yeah, that's good. Uh, two questions. One is for your reverse Christian connection with the entanglement battery. Do you need LCP, or is it okay if I do global unitary? 
Um, I've forgotten, um, but I, I think you have to communicate. Okay. Yeah, I think that's the same as the. Sorry. And the difference to a bedroom. Yes, indeed, indeed. Now that you say that, I remember that. Yes. Uh, and now my question is so you're saying you, you're not discussing the flipper and hanging with reversible because the scale of the end. But isn't there a similar finite size effect or a finite entanglement effect? Yes. So that you'll only get the true reversal position if you take the size of the bed is true to infinity. Um, I don't think that that's the same thing. Um, I would have to think about that a bit more, but I don't think it's the same thing. So, so you don't get any square root of n in, in the sense of the amount of entanglement that in the battery is exactly the same in the reverse process. So, if you have, if you if you've got to do this many times, then you don't see any. Then, in terms of the fluctuations of entanglement in that battery, it's the same. The fact that the battery has to be very large, I think, is nothing to do with reversibility at all. Yeah, so I would, I, I, I would say that no, that, that that's a very different situation. It's quite different. Okay, well. okay thanks. More anybody's questions? Lots of questions. I forget that. Okay, I, I can. Um, oh, yeah, it's I can, like, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, but it's, it's kind of in a similar spirit. So, so it seems that there, there will be an, an error in the transformation when the, the battery is just finite yeah. in size. Yeah. Yeah, so, so there's a similar, I guess, similar trade off. Also, when you say reversible, a trade off in what sense? Like, I mean, it's, it's so. Yeah, in terms of that, you need to, to have something grow in order to make the error vanish. Uh, it's true, but no, 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 this is different. So it's true that the size of the battery has to get very large. But what? But the reason that people say, oh, root n, we don't worry about it, is they divide by n. Like, great. But like, the bank doesn't care. The bank cares about how many units you borrow. It doesn't care that you're going to divide by n and say, well, relative to what I'm trying sure, to do yeah. with this really big project, it's a very small amount. The bank, no, the bank's not going to care that your project is really big. Where's the bank? So it's cleaner. Yeah, I, I agree. It's kind of. Clean the notion of uh, right. reversibility sometimes. Yeah. Um, but I guess you're also using the uh, a different battery for the reverse. No, it's the same battery. So as long as it's big enough, it can be you can use it. To, you know. Now of course, the bigger it is, you need to make it very big in order to always be using. You know, like it'll degrade after a while. Mm. I think with Camille and. Uh, we did some work on these kinds of things, like the degrading, of, but it was in the context of work. Like if you want a work battery for energy to do coherent thermal operations, then that also degrades a little, eventually it'll kind of pick the ground state. Um, I'm just going to give you my, uh, do you want to ask a question? Then I'll give my final four laws. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, no. It was... And then maybe next thing you can prepare. Or... Okay. Just wanted to, oh, that's loud. Uh... To offer maybe a, a way to see these different kinds of, of large end behaviors. Mm -hmm. So I think you could think of the battery having to be large as the bank that has to be very large to be able to offer to actually convert states. And only if the bank is huge, it can actually convert up. That's helpful, yeah. And that's the case of the thermal state, right? The thermal state only doesn't change if it's very large and then it doesn't change and we can keep using it to convert our resources for work here. So the four laws of quantum resource theories there, the zeroth law just tells you what your invariant set is and you, and it, you know, so that's the kind of the in thermodynamics, it's just that all oh, yes. the equivalence classes of states at the same temperature. The first law is the interconversion of resources in the multiple resource theory. The second law, we should stop with these many second laws. I apologize for that. Fluctuating resource equalities are the way to go. And the third law is to use these fluctu fluctuation relations to look for the time of the resources which are needed for transition. And thanks very much for your attention. Okay.